And we shall start with the presentation of Mr. Itamar Levin, who is a senior legal uh, correspondent and a Holocaust uh, researcher whose articles and studies on the subject of the money of the murdered Jews in the Holocaust became known, as well as many other studies that uh, received a lot of uh, attention in the Israeli media, and I'll ask him to uh, speak about his recent study about the uh, trials of Jews who were accused of no need to applaud at this stage. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for coming. In 1951, David Fellinker, the uh, journalist, wrote in Ma'ariv newspaper about this dialogue that he had with a Holocaust survivor that he met. That Holocaust survivor told him the following. He said, it's great that my parents and my family members are not alive and they don't need to see me because I was a couple. I received more bread and I was not beaten up. I beat up others. Uh, initially, my hand shivered when a Nazi ordered me to beat up Jews, but I got used to this and I became an expert. And he, the Nazi, actually uh, tapped me on the shoulder and said, well done, well done. Aren't you escaping from me? Because I would give so much if I could escape myself right now. Yes, you could shoot me in the face and you can hand me over to a policeman and I'll be grateful. Maybe that would bring about the end. Because as you can see, my Nazi was the greatest of the cruelest of people. Other Nazis killed their own couples and he, the couple, was the last victim. But my Nazi was smarter. He only murdered my soul and he put my soul into the guest chamber but he left my body alive. And this is how I move from one land to another, from one city to another, from a street to another, and that capo sign on my forehead. P people in the streets do not see the truth, but I see the truth. Every day and every night I see this sign on my forehead and I keep reciting to myself, I was a capo. If this is how the person who himself was a capo, himself was a Holocaust survivor, if this is a sense of shame that, as he says, he goes to sleep with in the evening and wakes up with in the morning, he sees himself every day in the mirror when he shaves himself and he sees this cane sign. Is this the feeling of the man himself? What would be the feeling of all those around him? What would be the feeling of the survivors? What would be the feeling of those people who he beat up? Now this is a rhetorical question because we know the answer to it. But just a methodical comment concerning what a capo is. Capo, the source is the Italian word. In the labor camps, the concentration camps, it was the role of those who were in charge of a group of uh, workers. However, in the 1940s and mostly in the 1950s, the word capo became a generic term in Israel. A generic word is one which represents a specific noun it, that turns into a general noun. If you take telephone, for example, telephone is the name of a company, it's a brand, but everyone calls the cell phone a telephone. You know what a frigider is? Do you know that we used to have this? It's a name of a company. Uh, Arctic and Cartiv are names of companies that manufacture ice lollies. Capo has also become generic. Everyone who had, every Jew who had any role or any position under the Nazi regime received the title of a capo. And it wasn't exactly very respectful. Nobody meant to flatter them or compliment them by saying this. It was meant to shame them. And this is the title of my lecture. Understanding where the shame stems from, today we call it shaming. We still don't have a word for this in, he in Hebrew. Be usual, it's a lot more than that. Where is the shaming coming from? We have to take a step back to understand this and go back 60 years, maybe even 70 years, to the days in which the Jewish settlement in the land of Israel became aware of what was happening in the Holocaust. And very quickly, the cre there is a juxtaposition created between that passive Jew that goes to uh, 
his death like sheep to slaughter, and the Zionist young new Sabra that is fighting for his or her life. And it really doesn't matter if that is true or not, because the way of myths and conceptions is that they have a life of their own, and the facts don't matter that much. These uh, perceptions become stronger when Holocaust survivors start arriving in Israel in 1945 and later, and very quickly what emerges is the two groups, this juxtaposition between the two groups. There were those heroes, those underground fighters, members of the Zionist youth movements, and if they came from the left even better, and all the rest, all the others. Try to imagine for a second the monument of the Warsaw uh, Ghetto, even those who were, didn't visit it know its replica in the Yad Vashem area. This is where the central ceremony for Holocaust Remembrance Day takes place every year. So what you see here is the fighter that holds this primitive uh, a hand grenade or the Molotov cocktail. He is the one that is uh, you know, carried on the shoulders of the masses of the suppressed people of the ghetto and they carry him on their shoulders. So this is the perception of Nathan Rappaport when he made that monument five years after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and that is the prevailing perception uh, for dozens of years. My topic is not if that changes and how, it does change. However, when we talk about the trials of the capos, the different officers, these trials take place at the beginning of the 1950s, and you cannot understand them I without the background of that perception that says that those who went like sheep to slaughter or the victims were, went like sheep to slaughter are at best worthy of our mercy or compassion, in the worst case are, you know, ridicule. Moreover, the ones that collaborated with the Nazis. This is a very dichotomous approach, a very simplistic one. If you had any role in uh, the uh, Nazi machine, then it means that you were an accomplice. It's very simple. Nobody looks at the complexity. Nobody looks at the question, why did you carry out this job? Or what job did you have? To begin with, was it forced or was it done willingly? Did you use this power you know, for good ends or bad ends. And this is where I have to say something that if I wrote this, I would make it very highlighted and use the font or the size of the font that would be very large, even 18. Many of the different officers, the office holders, were noble people. I don't have the stats. Nobody actually did the stats. But very, quite a few of those different uh, officers used the powers vested in them to rescue Jews. A week ago, one of the heroes of the Holocaust passed away, an unknown individual, Yaakov Chiquito Maestro. He was a teenager, 15 or 16 years old, when he arrived from Saloniki to Auschwitz. He was very diligent, he could speak German, and the Germans have him uh, placed in one of the uh, labor uh, offices, and his role was to actually organize the labor battalions. And he very quickly learned that with a bit of bribe and, uh, you know, uh, you know, Com compliments to the right people, he could actually remove people from the uh, terrible battalion uh, and transfer them to those battalions where their chances of survival would be higher and better. In the 1950s, if Jaquita would have walked around Tel Aviv, people would have screamed capo at him and stoned him. But this is just an example. He passed away last week, and that's an, uh, an opportunity to give an exa example of a different sort. Why would I use bold letters for it? Because my study, and quite naturally what I'm going to say in the next 15 minutes that I have, and that was just an introduction so far, will present the others. Because my study deals with those who were brought to trial. Those who were brought to trial, at least there were evidence showing that they abused their power. However, about one-third of the defendants were acquitted. I found documentation of 23 trials that took place mostly at the beginning of the 1950s, another one at the beginning of the 1960s, third of which were acquitted. Even those who were convicted only received symbolical punishments. And I only want to talk about the component of shame here. 
when the police starts examining and investigating those complaints against uh, filed against those uh, officers, it discovers very quickly that it's not only a matter of shaming, but also various, you know, uh, cases of extortion and uh, uh, lies. For example. A certain individual w was brought to trial in 1971 because he demanded 2,000 lira from another person, a fortune, a real fortune, and he threatens him, if you don't give it to me, I'll tell everyone you are a couple. And just pay attention. If he says to others that he was a couple, it really doesn't matter if there is a police investigation or not. He will no longer deserve to live among the normal individual. This was a very small you know, Jewish settlement in the area of Tel Aviv. Almost everyone knew everyone, definitely among the survivors. Suffice it to say that someone was a couple, that that would finish him off. You didn't need Facebook in those days. It was face to face and that was enough. After a decade, a manager in Miftachim Pension Fund sues a clerk in the company for libel because he spreads the rumors that when the large ghetto was uh, uh, closed, that he was walking around with an officer that was in charge of the liquidation of that ghetto. In other words, the shaming phenomenon and the shame phenomenon works both ways. The people themselves, at least some of them, are ashamed to say that they played a role. And just notice what that survivor, that capo, says to David Frankel. He doesn't even talk about what he did. He says, this is who I was, and that's enough. That's sufficient. And it also works because, uh, in another way, because there, some people take advantage of it and exploit it to their own ends. But I'd like to talk about another component of shame that comes from the other angle. And in my view, it is fascinating. You know, each of us has our own interests, but I think that it at least requires another discussion of one of the key questions that this young country had to deal with concerning the Holocaust. What do I mean? Another one of those myths that we know of the great silence. That's how it's called. The survivors never talked, they never gave testimonies, they withdrew from others, and that was it. That was the end of it. At least in my study, I find that when it comes to uh, trying and investigating, there was no silence and definitely there was no great silence. What do I mean by that? Beyond those 40 people who were brought to trial, I found the minutes of 23, but about 40 were tried. At least 120 additional cases were investigated uh, by the police, but no trial uh, ensued. I read all those cases and what remained of them. And this is an amazing phenomenon. It is something that you cannot find in those files and cases. You know what you couldn't find? You couldn't find one case that people said that, that we could not find evidence because the witnesses were not willing to talk. There was not one case in which they summoned a witness, in other words, a survivor, to give testimony and he said, I, didn't, I don't want to come. Th not one case like that was found. And I think that a few dozens of such uh, investigations are at least a representative sample that requires some thinking. So what's going on here? Let's talk about shame, not of the office holders, but rather the survivors. Now, I'll make it even more pronounced because some of the issue of shame that accompanies guilt definitely is there. Silence stems in Teralia because of shame. You know, stemming from the question, question of why did I survive? Am I better than my father? Am I better than my children? Am I better than the rabbi of my township? Am I better than the great intellectual? And here, by the way, a certain, you know, we come a full, full circle with respect to the office holders because a part of this approach is that if I survived, apparently I did something bad. Why did they take pity on me? Maybe I served the Nazis, that's why. So all the circles sort of close one on top of the other. So a survivor might not talk because questions would come up. How did you survive would be 
how did you survive, you know, with a different tone? Moreover, the silence is there on the familial plane. We know about many of the sur many of the survivors who never spoke to their children, only to their grandchildren. One of the reasons why, as of the 1970s, uh, more and more books are written about the Holocaust, uh, simply because those uh, you know people started writing to their grandparents, not their children. So, is there shame or is there no shame? On the one hand, the survivors are ashamed to say that they survived because. You know, someone might use the term human dust, and people did do that, and, or say that if you were saved, apparently you did something bad to earn it. But on the same side, survivors do not talk to their family members, but on the other hand, they do very fluently write pages with uh, foreigners, with police investigators. They go to court to give testimonies, again, in a very tough situation. What does it mean to bring a victim to a uh, trial, to put him on the witness stand and to hear them talk? Here and there, there are mental problems. The, you do encounter witnesses who experience a mental breakdown on the stand. Here and there, there's a witness that screams and even needs to be arrested because he, go, you know, he flies off the handle. But it's not, you know... Silence, it's, it's a way of people crying out their plight. I, you know, I'm no psychologist or anthropologist or any of that, but I do want to propose an explanation. Beyond the fact that the great silence is a myth that has been blown uh, up a lot into proportions that are far greater than it truly is, there's a difference between the personal plane and the public plane, and perhaps that brings us to opposite places. We would think that at home, within their families, people would speak more freely. And in the outside uh, world, uh, in public, they would do something else, but that is not true. We know this from daily life. Sometimes it's a lot easier to open up to uh, uh, a stranger. I'd like to say that when the survivors were asked to give testimonies to witness against those who actually wronged them, they had absolute no shame. But when they wanted to present justice as they saw it subjectively, there was no shame and no silence. So you can tie this to another point. Many uh, survivors, when they were asked how they survived, many of them answered that what gave them the strength was the will to survive and tell. It comes up in many testimonies, including those who uh, were in that toughest of places. The ability to come back and tell is actually their raison d'etre. So when they encounter a worldview that says that if you survived, it means that you did something bad. And if you were exterminated, and there's a contradiction on the one hand, they say that those who were exterminated uh, went like sheep to slaughter, and those who survived must have done something terrible. So what should have been done? But if you are in a society where the uh, diaspora Jew is the negative of the Zionist Sabra, people don't wish to tell anyone, but when you're asking them to tell, then the dam breaks down. A few more words about the results of those trials. Just another aspect, perhaps. If we spoke earlier about shame, let's take uh, advantage of the next four minutes to talk about pride. When one reads the minutes and the rulings uh, of those trials, I, at least as a legal correspondent or journalist, I was filled with pride because of the Israeli uh, judiciary. 
We know there is debates in public about uh, judicial activism, yes or no, but in the 1950s, they didn't even have any papers. The minutes of those trials, the judges wrote in their handwriting on the backside of uh, mandatory documents, because that's all they had. It's a system that did not have the means or the power or the, there were no secretaries even. And this system could take those trials, the, 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 those charged, highly charged trials and to run them like any other trial. From the procedural point of view, yes, they were debating whether you know, you could remember after so many years if the memories and the terrible events did not appear in layers, one atop the other, and make the latest one, uh, make the previous one uh, sort of be forgotten by others because of the latest ones. And don't take this too lightly, because if we add up that social atmosphere that I talked about before, it's not a simple thing to do, you know. The easiest thing would be to convict every person who was a capo, so let's not sentence him to death or life imprisonment. We can give him two months. It's the easiest thing to do, but it wasn't done. And the judges know how to look at the detail, the, the, the last detail of every case, to take an indictment and break it down to components and convict in Article A to acquit in Article D and to say that there's decisive evidence for C. And the court can take such rulings and sometimes turn them upside down. So if we are talking about uh, the shame that covered our faces, in most cases, it was not justified because those who were saved definitely did not need to be ashamed of it. Those who had any job to do were supposed to be judged by himself or herself and, you know, in their circumstances. And those who were brought to trial and tried, definitely they needn't be ashamed of it. They can only be proud. Thank you very much.